the Tub Talks with Damon. <laughs> My very special guest today in the tub is author, biographer, journalist, James Gavin. Damon, never thought I'd be here. You it's never thought you'd be you. here? You never thought you'd be in a tub with me? Yes, this is, this is delightful. <laughs> and I'll tell you why it's delightful. I'd like to begin by telling you a story, if you don't mind. Please do. I'd love to hear a story. When I was five years old, I grew up in South Yonkers, uh -huh. uh, the wrong side of the tracks. There was beautiful, hilly, and verdant North Yonkers, where the real homes were, and there were the apartment buildings, tenement-like apartment buildings in South Yonkers, and that's where I was. And uh, it was a blazing hot day in the summer, and my mother took my sister and I to my aunt's house. She lived around the corner and up a hill, and she lived in a three-story shack, basically, six apart, three apartments. And uh, there was an inflatable kiddie pool out front, and some of the a couple of her kids, and me and my sister, and my mother, and my aunt were all going to gather on this summery day. Hot, hot, hot day. I was wearing shorts and a little undershirt. Remember, I was five years old. We settled in there and my mother said, uh, take off your shirt. And I said, no. And she said, oh, come on. My mother was and is very pushy. And I wouldn't do it. And she forced me to take my shirt off because she thought this was ridiculous. And I responded by running behind a folding chair and hiding. Now, where did I get that shame about my body when I was five years old? Where did you? Where did that come from? I only have theories about that. A uh, Catholic boy, later on I became an altar boy. Very soon after that I was an altar boy from second grade until eighth grade. And uh, lots and lots of Catholicism seeped into my bloodstream where it in fact still remains. Mm. Anyway, cut to November of 2022, and I saw an article about you, and I saw pictures of you in the bathtub with a couple of your guests, and I did not hesitate to send that email to you, basically volunteering to be on your show. So, and here we are in this bathtub on TV. Obviously, a lot has changed since I was five years old. Wow. Well, so that kind of leads to my first question, or maybe it doesn't, but I, I am curious to know what you like most about your body today. And then I want to hear more about the, the journey to how you went from hiding behind a folded chair to being in my tub right now. I didn't like anything about my body for the first many years of my life. I was not fat, but I was pudgy. I became very self-conscious about my body, increasingly so, uh, right, right up until my late teens. Uh, be, because, okay, I went to Fordham University in the Bronx. And one of the things I used to do to torture myself was during the breaks in between classes, I would walk through this big field of grass in the middle of campus that I think was called the Quadrangle. And I would see shirtless jocks playing frisbee. And I became of the aware, aware of the fact that there were people who looked better than I did, that I didn't look like that. And I began, see, food was a big thing when I was growing up. Things were not so happy at home. Food was one of my solaces, along with uh, books and records, old singers, the voices on records. These were all the things that got me through my childhood. It was not until I was in my 20s, in fact, at the age of 24, I, I feel like I'm sinking off the edge of the image. It was not until I was 20, I'm slowly disappearing into the, behind the shower curtain. Anyhow, um, I got my first set of weights when I was 24 years old, and I began working with them, and I began to see a little difference, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And... I am an obsessive person about things that interest me, and I really got into it. I never became a big muscle brute, but I did develop the body that I now have, which is, uh, I guess, could 
kindly be called a swimmer's body. I'm lean and it's not difficult to maintain the kind of body that I have. I don't have big uh, heaving pectorals and big gigantic guns. That, that kind of stuff can be harder to maintain as you get older. So what do I like about my body now? I like the fact that I have had a 32 inch waist for years. I like the fact that I am healthy and energetic and that it reflects itself in the way that I look. I can wear clothes well. Uh, nothing is sagging because my weight doesn't change. I think that the reason that jowls and things set in is because people's weight goes up and down and up and down and then the, ultimately the skin just gives out. So I don't have that problem. I'm quite comfortable in my body. And so uh, sitting here in this bathtub with you in front of your camera is fine. That's great. Have you ever done a naked interview before? Or done there, are, there aren't that many of them out there. I guess not. <laughs> the answer to your question wow. is no, I am not. So you're volunteering. You're reaching out to me and volunteering to do this interview. It seems like you're kind of making a, a, a statement with that. Something, saying something for yourself. Yeah. Or, yeah, I love, yeah, sure. Uh, for one thing, I like the way you interview people. You. And I love the form, the, the format of this show just tickled me. And uh, I know that you seek to, you know, make a kind of close connection with, with people by, by doing it at your bathtub. And I just thought that that was so cute. Uh, and I could see that you're easy to talk to. Thank you. That is a compliment. And we just met, folks. So this is the great thing about doing a bathtub interview is that I just, ago, you know, get to meet cool people. Thank you. I really feel honored, especially because you do a lot of interviews. A lot of your life and work is interviewing people and talking with people. I've interviewed thousands of people since I was 20 years old. Wow. So how did that get started? How did you start this journey of being the asker? I was, again, uh, I was a writing student at Fordham. <clears throat> I had a burning desire to be a writer. I wanted to write about music. Specifically, I wanted to write about singers because although I'm not a singer myself, the voices on records were my best friends when I was growing up. I found great comfort in those voices, especially women's voices. And I became interested in old New York nightlife, specifically the cabarets that used to be all over town uh, and, that, and that defined a certain brand of high sophistication in New York. The hippest, coolest, smartest people went to places like the Blue Angel, the Bon Soir, the upstairs at the downstairs. And for some reason, all of that appealed to me greatly. I wanted to prove myself to be a real sophisticate. I wanted New York City. I wanted uh, to be in the fast lane of the smartest people I could possibly be around. And all of that could be found wrapped up in those old cabarets. Now, when I started my book, the, the, that old world was kind of in ruin. There were a few little vestiges of it here and there. When was that? When did you start? The, 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 mid, the, the, the mid 80s, more or less, while I was in college. And, uh, but I, I, I began finding the places that existed in Greenwich Village and so forth. And so I was, uh, I had a writing tutorial with my professor at Fordham and I would bring in things that I'd written and he would critique them. And I began writing essays about my trips to these little places. And I said to him one day, gee, nobody has ever written a book about all those little cabarets that used to be all over New York. And wouldn't it be great if somebody did? And he said, why don't you? Mm. And those three words gave me my life. It was an explosion inside my head. And I immediately began pursuing people on sheer nerve, really, because I had, I decided I wanted to write a book that was something about the old nightclubs and people who sang in them. And I used to go often to hear, the, my favorite singer when I was growing up was Carmen McRae, the great jazz singer, who would appear at the Blue Note twice a year and I would go. I could somehow scrape the money together to go and see Carmen and Carmen was really tough. 
I didn't know what a tough reputation she had. She could terrify musicians. She could terrify people in the press. And I, at the age of 20, walked up the stairs to her dressing room. I, was, I can tell you exactly what I was wearing. I was wearing a beige corduroy jacket whose sleeves were too long. I was wearing a, a peach print shirt that would have melted if you left it out in the sun. Uh, a brown knit tie, ultra nerd, mega nerd, brown loafers, and I was a dorky kid. And I walked into her dressing room and said, Miss McRae, I'm so-and-so, I'm writing this book about sing cabaret singers and I'd like to interview you. And she said, yes. Wow. I was thrilled, but I didn't realize how big that was because when I came back to do the interview and it went beautifully, and, and she even told me, because it was done in between sets of the Blue Note the following night, I think, uh, she said, well, if you didn't get enough tonight, then come back tomorrow. And I met her manager, a man named Kim Hartstein, and I told, he introduced himself, I told him what had happened and he seemed really surprised. He told me later on that Carmen had said no to People magazine and had told the lady from Ebony to fuck off. And I figured that I was doing the right thing. Wow. Interviewing is my favorite thing in life. So you just went up and asked her, you can interview her. You weren't like a major media conglomerate. You didn't, you weren't like this company. You were like a person saying, I want to interview you. I was a kid, spot. I was a kid who loved her. Carmen could spot a phony and that I was not. And so that made me feel that I was on the right track in life. And her manager told me to send him a list of everyone I wanted to interview. Mm -hmm. And if he could, if he had their contact info, he would give it to me and I could use his name. So I was off and running. I, but again, no contract, no track record, no uh, agent, no nothing except desire and knowledge. I knew a lot about these people's lives. They were kind of tickled by that. They were amused. So that's what got me started. And I'm a student of the art of the interview. I study, I have a big collection of recorded interviews, not only my own, but of other people. So I study the way people interview and I learn from their mistakes and I learn from their assets. And uh, it's, it's the, the, it gives me the most pleasure of anything to do with what I do. Now, were these on like cassette players or mini cassette players or what, what were you recording on? Back I was recording on a standard portable cassette player and I have, I still, they, I have them all. I have a copy of almost every interview I've ever done. And as I Whoa. said, they number in the thousands now. A lot of those people are no longer around, which makes those interviews, especially people in the jazz and cabaret world. So that makes those interviews kind of valuable. What do you want to, I mean, I don't think you've written a book about all of them, have you? Or... Well, every book that I've done, I've had five out now. Every book has averaged about 300 interviews. And then there's my journalism because I've written hundreds of articles. I've written hundreds of CD liner notes mm -hmm. and other things. So I just interview everybody that I can to get their stories down. It's very important because once people are gone, they're gone. Yeah. What are the um, what are the mistakes you see interviewers making? Where do I begin? Not you. <laughs> you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not making any mistakes. Uh, lack of preparation is often not always, but often a mistake because sometimes if you just talk, interesting things can come out. But if you're doing a, a, an information gathering interview, then you have to know everything you can possibly find out before you walk in there. It also gives your subject a sense that you've done their homework and they'll respond better. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that um, not listening carefully. You do that very well. Many people do not. Uh, you have to give people a sense that the, that the air is clear, that there, there's no static, that there's no impatience, you're, that you're not uh, dying to, to die, these bubbles are a kick, a kick, that you're not dying, I, as I just gestured, I saw that I look like, you know, anyway, we won't go down that road. Are you, is your, <laughs> your self-critical voice coming out right now? Yes. What, 
What is the critical voice trying to tell you? The critical voice is trying to tell me that I just digressed from what I was saying mm -hmm. and that I should get back on track. Okay. So what if we consider no should and just have a conversation? I'm game. Okay. okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, other mistakes that interviewers yeah. make. Um, those are the two main ones I'd say. Mm -hmm. Listening is very, very important. That's what you do in your line of work. You listen. Mm -hmm. You know, I the thing I see a lot of people doing, especially these days, that I don't like is interrupting people. Oh, yeah. And I see a lot of people online, and sometimes, you know, if you're on the red carpet or you've got only three minutes with someone, you kind of have to do that. But I just, I don't like it. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like, some, you know, it's it, when someone's trying to tell their story and you shut them down, and I just, I, I hate watching that and seeing that. Yeah, interrupting. It's hard not to do it sometimes. sometimes. Sometimes you're talking with people and you just can't stop doing it because no matter how you try, you both can come back in at the same point and, and, uh, and step on each other. I work on it all the time. I'm, I'm not spotless in that regard, but, but the way you can avoid it is by just saying as little as possible. Yeah. Wow. Letting people talk. It's letting them tell their story. Wow. Bingo. Which um, interviewers did you look up to, or do, do you think are, who does consistently good interviews in your opinion? Oh, great question. Let's see. I was on Terry, I was on Fresh Air once, uh -huh. a long time ago. I was on, I'm, I'm sliding. Mm -hmm. I was on uh, Fresh Air with Terry Gross in 2002 for my Chet Baker biography. And Terry is, superb at what she does. I admire her so much. Um, let's go down some of the major ones. Interestingly, and he's not mentioned as often as he could, but Dick Cavett had a wonderful, I'm so glad. I love Dick Cavett. I interviewed Dick Cavett once. Dick oh Cavett gosh. has a wonderful, had what he did looked so offhanded that I don't think people took it as seriously as they should have because Dick Cavett had a wonderful ability to put people at ease and to make people feel safe so he is uh, he is one of the interviewers i look to like I, uh, there's a lot of his stuff on youtube that i consider a source that i want to emanate when i do these interviews even though he didn't do naked interviews but if he had done naked interviews this is you know i i try to emanate that spirit of just like being jovial but open and just bringing out the best energy in all of his guests i really enjoy the way he always or consistently did that it worked beautifully with almost everyone he ever interviewed. Yeah. And that's why Dick Cavett's interviews as a body of work are so tremendously important. Also, he had superb taste in interviewees and he was not afraid of the highbrow. And I think that's the reason why Dick Cavett's, he didn't last very long on ABC TV, then he went to public television. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he stayed on public TV until around 82, I guess, 83. But I don't think it was a high-rated show because it was so uh, intellectual. And the conversation was not frivolous. It was deep. Right. But it, he didn't force that matter. It just, it's, it, it, the subjects that he, he, he uh, chose were, were thoughtful, uh, d deeply talented, in intelligent people. I love that. I love that. And so I, like you, I think, I abhor an age of superficial interviewing. I'm not interested in quote-unquote celebrity interviews because they don't have anything to offer me. It's, it's uh, shallow stuff. And I really want to get into the, the deep waters. Yeah. Uh, that's my joy. Wow. Okay, Barbara Walters? No. <laughs> Why not? No, not at all. I think Barbara Walters is a silly lady in a lot of ways, despite the fact that she's one of the great achieving women mm -hmm. of the 20th century, without a doubt. Um, I don't take her uh, seriously as an interviewer. I don't take her seriously as a researcher. I, 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 I respect, all due respect to her achievement, which as I said, was incredible. A woman in the media who mm -hmm. reached the heights that she reached. But uh, um, kind of a, a star fucker in terms of her interviews. If you're on horseback with your subject and shown trotting down a lane, 
if you're cozying up to your subject in ways that, that purportedly are to get the inside skinny and to get people really close to you and I, I don't I don't I don't think that it worked I, I don't I don't look up to her at all she was also um, one example comes to mind and that is uh, Greg Louganis when she interviewed Greg Louganis and she was so she always looked so prissy and constipated and she was so confrontational with poor Greg Louganis about the fact that he had hit his head and blood bled a little bit in this gigantic chlorinated pool. And uh, I thought, oh, get over it, lady. You, you don't know, what do you, you don't know anything about this. Yeah. All right, that's enough trashing of Barbara Walters. Okay. How about Oprah? Oh, God. Um, better than Barbara. Uh -huh. um, Being a gigantic woman of the media, she has her eye on the ratings. She has her eye on getting to stuff that can be turned into um, sound bites and, uh, and attention. And so uh, she, entered, she had George Michael on, as you know. She did an hour with George Michael when his US career was uh, struggling to stay afloat when he had an album out called Patience. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the advanced press on George's uh, uh, hour with Oprah, which did not, interestingly enough, did not make that album a success, that album Patience. Mm -hmm. It didn't make it a success in the US. Uh, there was lots and lots of advanced hype about how George Michael was finally going to come clean about, and you know, and had a bullet list of scandals. That's what it was all about. Um, that is what it is. It's, 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 it's big ratings and attention getting interviewing, but that's not what I aspire to. Yeah. She's just, I like her so much, but I don't like the way she interrupts people. Yeah. And she always interrupts her guests. So a lot of times she's someone who does interview people and once they start to go deeper, she cuts them off. And that's, that's frustrating for me. It's yeah, that's an ego, that's an ego thing because yeah. interviewers can't, it's not about you. Yeah. It's about the person you're talking to. And uh, you can never forget that. Yeah. Uh, if you, and if, if your interviewee is aware of the fact that you're competing for the spotlight, then I don't think the results are going to be great. Wow. All right. I appreciate your perspectives. Well, okay. You, so you started interviewing people and really found your calling. Yes. And did anyone ever try to turn it around on you and try to ask you questions? Or were they just more just like, all right. I'm, I'm happy you're asking me the questions. More the latter, because uh -huh. show business people love to talk about themselves, yeah. which is fine with yeah. me. That's what I'm there for. Um, Did you ever want people to ask you questions? I wasn't secretive about who I was and where I was coming from and why I was there. Uh, but to this day, it's not my objective when I talk to somebody. If you have some personal story to relate that... Uh, that can enrich the conversation or trigger something in them, that's one thing. But I'm very, very careful to avoid injecting needless stuff about myself when it's not about me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's how I feel. So one of the projects you have spent a great amount of time on and wrote a book about that just came out this past year, well, last year, because this is going to be in 2023, but in 2022, you had a book come out about George Michael. I did. So, and I love George Michael and uh, really have a lot of thoughts and want to hear your thoughts. So, but tell me, how did that come about where you became the biographer of this man who I think a lot of people thought they knew, but don't really, didn't know and maybe still don't really know? In 1996, George Michael released an album called Older. Yeah. Older was the album that spun my head around about George Michael. Up until that time, my head was not with George Michael. I almost exclusively listened to older, primarily female singers, because I've always found that um, women tend to have less hangout pups about expressing their innermost feelings than men do. And so I felt wisdom and comfort coming from the voices of women. 
anyway. And I was not interested in pop singing at all, really. Uh, that kind of big commercial pop singing, but Older was different. Older was an album he had made after he had fallen off of his uh, stratospheric pedestal that he was on during the Faith, his first album, and to a lesser degree, the second album, Will Sin Without Prejudice, Volume 1. Older was an album that in which he basically tried to resurrect his uh, deceased love, the love of his life, a Brazilian man named Anselmo who had died of AIDS. And uh, they had been together for only a year and a half when Anselmo died. And so George was devastated with this loss. He felt that that a miracle angel from on high had been snatched away from him. And he created this album in which he poured out his heart. George was still not saying, I am gay, the words that a lot of people increasingly wanted him to say. But this album, which was dedicated to Anselmo, was his way of hopefully getting at the more truthful George Michael. I was so moved by this album. And uh, the album was number one in the UK and it flopped in the US. And that made me feel kind of protective toward George and this album. And uh, years passed and, on, and also wanting to write something about him somehow, some way, someday. December 25th, 2016, I was at a family Christmas gathering and got the news that George had died. And I texted my agent and I said, everybody's going to want to write this book, but I have to at least throw my hat in the ring. Well, uh, my proposal was on editor's desks by early January. And we did not sign to do this book. We, uh, Abrams eventually said yes uh, until May the 1st, my contract was dated, because, because it seemed that I was the only one who had pitched that book. If anybody else did, I'm unaware of it. And we barely sold it. Abrams saved us because most of the other publishers either wanted a quickie bio, like a quick turnaround thing to cash in on the death, or it seemed to me a lot of them regarded him as a, a, a fallen relic of 1980s pop who did not have the cachet of people like, um, all of whom died around the same time, David Bowie, uh, Lou Reed, Leonard Cohen, and Prince. Prince. Yeah. yeah. Multiple books were signed on those people, mm -hmm. and I had to struggle to get George through. And George was a bigger star when he was a star than any, really, than any of them had been. He was gigantic in the late 80s. What do you make of that? Why, why wasn't there a, a lot of interest in George's, George's life and his story? There was and is in the UK, where he, he is still a prince, but in the US, George had been out of the spotlight in, the U in, in, in this country for so long, and he wasn't seen as cool anymore. And I think that the infamous bust in which he was um, uh, arrested in, um, uh, out, right outside a men's room for indecent behavior in the men's room in a park in, uh, right on the West Hollywood Beverly Hills border, where George used to cruise very, unjudiciously, if that's a word. And uh, that really disgraced him. And I think that it left a permanent stain. Uh, and then the latter stages of George's life, the last 15 years or so, were very sad. There, he was heavily addicted to drug, hard drugs, uh, GHB being his drug of choice in those last years. And um, they just weren't excited about the idea of a George Michael biography, and it was my job to prove them wrong, and I did. Yeah. Say more. How did you prove them wrong? Because the book came out, and it got worldwide attention. Uh, it's been published in other several other countries. There are more on the way. Um, the press that it got was, by and large, splendid. And it brought George Michael more attention than anything had in probably since his, his death. Mm -hmm. And so 
and it most most important is the fact that it touched people's hearts. I know it did. And I was able to find my empathy with George, which is a big, big word in my business. If you don't have empathy with your subject, then you shouldn't be writing mm -hmm. about that person. Was that hard to find the empathy for George? Took me about half, my pro the, the whole thing was um, five years from signing to publication. So it was a big chunk of my life. And, and like people who were actually close to George, I, um, I, you got frustrated with him as you watched him make wrong turn after wrong turn. Such as? Uh, suing his record company very unwisely, and it kind of sabotaged his U.S. career. Suing his record company for very personal reasons, not because they had let him down. I don't think that's what he said it was. They, he felt they dropped the ball on pr promoting his uh, second uh, big solo album. But because he was so unhappy with the George Michael that he had created, which he felt was a fraud, that I think he, um, he just wanted to tear down everything to do with that George Michael and start anew. He was also not great where accountability was concerned. So George uh, found it. Just keep talking. Yeah, talking. Right ahead. Hey. George, yeah, I'm good. Hey. George, um, I almost knocked a little. That's okay. That's yeah, share. <laughs> we got our icons here. Um, okay. He was such a lost soul, and he was so filled with um, self-hatred. He hated what he saw in the mirror, and he never got over it. It just got worse and worse. Uh, and then for the last 10, 12 years of his life, he was having public embarrassment after public embarrassment. And it was terribly sad. He was a lovable guy. By all reports, people, um, everybody who knew him loved him. But again, they were exasperated by George because they saw him capsizing and they couldn't really do anything about it. You know, I guess it's hard for me to imagine someone, and maybe this is where people get stuck, someone with that level of privilege, someone who was so successful in the 80s, so impossibly, beautifully gorgeous and talented and really doing well in terms of selling records, selling stadiums, having such a strong following and then, you know, sort of turning around and saying, oh, I hate all this. I think there's some, I guess for me, I just, maybe I have trouble having empathy around that. Not because I think that there's, I think that we are all responsible in many ways for what we create and we do want to create intentionally in this world. And maybe I'm just saying that from my point of view, because that's what I've done. Um, but then to, if it's not for you, then to say, all right, well, I want to show a different part of myself, or I don't want to play this teenage heartthrob anymore, or I want to do more mature music. Okay, fine, great. We've seen Madonna go through different incarnations. But what he seemed to do was rejecting that persona, and literally the freedom video is like blowing up the persona, and then I guess speaking out against it. I, I wonder if that's where sometimes he's lost some favor with the public. Sure, a lot of people looked at George and saw everything that you saw, this incredibly privileged uh, person who had wealth, success, looks, and uh, acclaim and adoration beyond belief. All of that should have been enough to make him happy, but it wasn't. And George uh, made a very insightful comment about superstardom. He said, that superstars are often made, they often happen, not based on what you have, but on what you don't have, on what the damage is, on what the holes are in your, in your happiness, especially in your self-esteem, which he had a very sad lack of. So I think that part of the reason George set his sights on superstardom is that he thought that the love of millions would somehow make everything all right. Mm. And it did not. Imagine that feeling when you're on the stages of arenas and stadiums and you have tens of thousands of people, girls, which wasn't his thing, screaming for you. And, all you, and, and you've created this George Michael character that got you there. And now you know that, that and now you feel like a, a total fraud because they're loving you for something that you're not. 
Imagine how that must have felt. I love that you're saying that. This comes up a lot in my work, in my therapy office. Because mm -hmm. this, a lot of people come to New York thinking if I could be successful, if I could get in movies, if I could get on Broadway, then I'll be happy, then I'll be secure with who I am. And I often ex point out examples where that has not been the case. George Michael, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Prince, Britney Spears, we could go on and on about people who really achieved barometers of success by cultural standards and still had that pervading sense of emptiness and loneliness in their lives and found that all that adoration on stages did not bring them a sense of love, a sense of connection, a sense of um, stability that they were seeking. What it can do is make you resent people around you because you don't believe them. Uh, it doesn't matter how many people tell you that you're gorgeous, tell you that you're great, because uh, uh, then too, a lot of um, uh, stars, no, not a lot, all stars have sycophants around them. They have people who will, are yes men and will say whatever it takes to remain in the stars, good graces. That was certainly the case with George Michael. And, uh, and, and these people are, how do you relate to people on a real human, honest level when you have thrust yourself into that stratosphere where nothing is earthbound, where almost nobody in your life, where you feel that almost nobody in your life is with you because they really love you? Mm -hmm. It's not that he didn't have a few people that he trusted and loved. One of them was his mother his lovely mother, Leslie, who gave him unconditional love and who died four years after Anselmo died of cancer prematurely. And it was with that loss that George felt that, he, that the universe really had it out for him. And that's when he went crazily spiraling out of control. What does that mean, spiraling? With drugs? With... I understand there were some car accidents along the way. That started a bit later, but um, depression. Uh, he was a full-time stoner starting in the mid-90s at least. When he made the older album, he had become a full-time stoner. And um, then he moved on to the hard stuff, which was um, GHB and secondarily crack cocaine. He was petrified of winding up the way Whitney wound up, and basically he did. Wow. And then he died on Christmas Day, 2016. As far as we know, it was Christmas Day. Yeah. Nobody, oh. I don't think anybody knows the exact hour that he died, but it is the accepted wisdom questioned by some is that he died on Christmas Day. And he was alone? He was, uh, as, again, as far as we know, yeah. because the only witness to his last 12 hours or so, as far as we know, was uh, his boyfriend, Fadi, mm -hmm. uh, gorgeous, uh, hot Lebanese man that was exactly George's type, hairy and swarthy and all. And Fadi was arm candy, but not much more. And um, he was with George on Christmas Eve and again on Christmas Day, and he claims that he walked into the room and found George Blue. That while he thought he was out of the house or something, I, I'm oh God, that, that's such a swarm of conflicting details. And we will probably never know exactly what occurred in the last 12 hours of George's life, but we do know that uh, his heart stopped beating, that he had a fatty liver, and his body was shot. It was shot from all the years of self-abuse. Um, and that was a track that I don't know that anybody could have taken him off of. Various people who were close to George felt that his friends had done him wrong because they hadn't tried to save George, but I think that George was unsavable. So determined was he to self-destruct. Why? He hated himself deep inside. Uh, he had grown up in a pretty homophobic atmosphere. Uh, compounded by the fact that when he was, uh, let me do the math, when he was in his late teens, uh, AIDS came on the scene and, 
and then gay men were now pariahs in a whole new way. They were considered these diseased, dangerous outcasts. And, and George, simultaneous to all of this, was chasing big, big stardom. And he knew that, those two, that in order to achieve one, he had to hide the other. Wow. How old was he when he passed? George was 53. 53. I'm 51 now. That's so weird. Because in my mind, you know, as a teenager, he was always like so much older. And like, wait, he wasn't like when he passed. He did a concert tour toward the end of his life called Symphonica. It would have been, let me see, 2011, 2012. And it was a somber concert with a very mature George Michael. He had become the George Michael he had always wanted to be, which was an adult. And he had a symphony orchestra behind him. He didn't come to the States. He only did it in, in Europe. And it is, so I never got to see it except the video. And it's a lot of, a lot of the older songs, a lot of the sadder patient songs are there. It's not a, the previous tour had been a greatest hits concert. And this concert was what George wanted to sing. And he, it showed you where he was at in his head. He was filled with regret and loss and longing. Wow. Do you think he ever experienced peace or true joy in his life? Well, let's see. Um, in the early, he said that in the early days of Wham, when he was young and it was still kind of a lark and he was working away with Andrew Ridgely on becoming big, he said that that was the happiest he ever was in, uh, in, in a show business sense because he had a cohort, he had Andrew, so he wasn't in it alone. And uh, he was just young and fancy free and, and having a good time for a while, but not for very long. Because then all the pressure that he heaped upon himself to become big, big, big started to set in. And then when he and, and Selma were together, they had a six month window of sheer joy. Uh, George met Anselmo in, in Rio in 1991, and uh, six month later, months later, Anselmo had his HIV test and was positive. And that dropped the iron curtain on everything. Now it was all about, he's going to die. The only question is when, what can we do to save him, to extend this, you know, not, you're not ending. George felt, I found the love of my life. And... He's, gonna, he's being taken away from me. But there are home movies which were uh, added to a documentary that George himself was working on called Freedom in the, the last year of his life. Home movies of him and Anselmo. And the joy is so poignant to see the two of them just clowning and open and loving. The problem with that relationship is that Anselmo, who was not famous, was very out. And George, who was a superstar, was very in. And this was frustrating for Anselmo. George, in fact, was not with Anselmo when he died. Hmm. So it's it's real messy. Was that a source of uh, guilt in his life? I think with him. I think so. I don't I don't have that in George George's words, but George was petrified of the media. And um, by this time people were kind of on to his secret mm -hmm. and he was just petrified. He was scared and it's very easy to pass judgment on somebody like who, who, who doesn't have the strength to say those magic words that everybody wants them to say. Which but words? I am gay. Ah. But the pressure that George was under, mm, rather the fear uh, of of losing everything that he had gained, of what his parents would think. He was just so scared, and the longer he waited, the harder it got. Do you think if he had been outed, even though I know that was quite, I, would, I wouldn't wish that trauma on anybody, but let's just say theoretically, if he had been outed in the 80s, do you think his life could have been easier? The rest of his life may have gone smoother. Happiness, I don't think, was in George's DNA. Why? Because of the, the churning inside himself that he felt of self-hatred. 
So uh, he would not have gotten what he wanted, which was stardom. And it, as, you, as, as you know, it came at a big, big price, that stardom, super stardom. Uh, could he have been happier and well-adjusted if he had just been honest? Probably he would not have gotten where he had, he wanted so desperately to go and he would have been miserable due to that. Mm, wow. It's a, right. it's a tough one, right? Way. Yeah. Yeah. Was he living with HIV? Did we ever know that? After George died and uh, his last boyfriend, Fadi, was on the warpath, mm -hmm. going out of his mind, uh, becoming tabloid fodder due to the way he was, the crazy way he was behaving and the things that he was tweeting, Fadi finally dropped a bomb and said George was HIV positive and um, that they had found out during a period in 20, during, in the middle of the Symphonica tour when George nearly died of pneumonia. And uh, Fadi said they found out in that period. And while Fadi is not to be trusted as a great source of truth, this makes perfect sense to me. And some of the conditions that he had when he uh, died are tied in with HIV and HIV medications, which leads me to believe that it was probably true. It certainly makes sense. And again, GHB. What conditions were? I detail them in my book, uh, specific physical issues that are related to, to, to uh, HIV and HIV meds. It's hard, it's, I don't, I don't want to okay. misquote myself. But I did a lot of research into it because I did find certain on online in the reporting, you did get to learn certain things about what had gone wrong with him physically. So I, I did my homework. I, I don't have any definitive word on that, by the way. But I think it's probably true. Yeah. That was within the HIV community, one of those things that was kind of known but not known. It was talked about as if it was fact, but no one could say, oh, I know this definitively. But I kind of wondered because it seems like it was something people, it's just sometimes, you know, we know things, but we don't know things, or we assume things, and then you, because someone else assumed it, you assumed it, and then I'm like, but where did that actually come from? And you mean came, about like, George? About his HIV status, oh, about living, word, having lived with HIV. Yeah, the word on the street, the gay word on the street yeah. had been that he was HIV positive for some time, and I don't have paperwork or direct testimony to, except for what Fadi yeah. said. But it makes perfect perfect sense. It wasn't denied when mm -hmm. Fadi tweeted this tweet. Nobody said, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, but all of this stuff seems terribly sad. And that is the reason why I was so happily surprised when from the beginning of my process with this book, I would mention George Michael to people and everybody just smiled. Oh, I love George Michael. And they would name a song, they would name a memory, they would just swoon over George Michael. And that meant that the, that the good feelings about George won out. They don't always. I think that when we think of Whitney, we think of tragedy. And when we think of people like Billie Holiday, we think of tragedy. And George had his own tragedy, and yet the good feelings were so good, they were so strong that they overrode the sadness. The joy he brought us, I think. Yeah. You know, joy he brought me. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad to oh, hear that. so much. Oh, I love his music. And then, so when I was opening my own, are you okay? Yeah, <laughs> my own psychotherapy practice, I was, uh, you know, kind of getting out of the nonprofit world getting into my own psychotherapy practice and, and his freedom song from Listen Without Prejudice was kind of my, my therapy theme song. Like, I am breaking free of these people. I cannot do nonprofit work anymore. I don't, you know, it's like, mm. this is my freedom now. That song became yeah. quite a bit um, universal, even though he was writing it about, at least consciously, about something very specific, which is that the MTV image of himself wasn't true. Yeah. And that it seldom was true what you saw on MTV. And yet that song took on a, a, a broader sense of breaking free. Yeah. And it really touched people. Yeah. I think for a lot of us, there was, you know, I want to break free. I guess today they have Beyonce's Break My Soul. That seems to be the breakout song. But, you know, 30 years ago, we were like, okay, I need to break free of this toxic situation or toxic relationship. And freedom is kind of an anthem for saying enough. Mm -hmm. Enough. 
Yeah, yeah. So these are the wonderful yeah. things that George left oh, us with. Yeah. I mean, plus my teenage hormones were quite... I, I mean, he's part of the reason why I knew I was gay was because that summer that Faith was a big hit and that whole year that he was on tour and on MTV nonstop was really a time that I started to become aware of my sexual attraction for him and for men in general. Isn't that great that George could bring you to that realization? Oh my goodness. Um, I think he brought a few straight guys to that revelation. I mean, it's yeah. just so. People haven't seen it. they got to go look at some of those videos. Yeah, young, uh, oh. young gay guys who are aware of George, and many of them are, see him as heroic. Yeah. They don't know all of the fine points of his psychological struggles and stuff. They don't know the fact that he only forcibly outed himself in this weird way yeah. and that he wouldn't do it the normal, painful way. Uh, all they know is that here is this big, strapping, sexy, butch guy standing on arena stages, being fabulous, and they know that he's gay, and that's what, that, that's what it all boils yeah. down to. If you could ask him any question, what would you ask him? Hmm. Hmm. Let me give that a moment of thought. I never met him, by the way. Sadly, I never met him. Um, I would... He, he had a very turbulent relationship with his dad. His dad, who was a Greek immigrant, uh, Greek Orthodox background, a lot of homophobia that George had to deal with, casual homophobia that was in the, in the household, relatives and so forth. Uh, talking in ways that made him feel really frightened and small. And I would ask him to talk more about, and honestly, about his relationship with his dad and how that made him feel. Because all of, generally all of our shit points back to our relationship with our parents, wouldn't you say? Much of the time. Yeah. Much, and, not always, but much, yeah. Yeah, and in George's case, that was certainly true. Even his mother, who early on in George's, um, youth was scared that her little boy was gay because her brother had yeah. been gay and uh had taken his own life and had suffered from mental illness and it was just a terrible portrait of what gay of what she felt gay life meant and so she went along with the dad's uh homophobia for a time but George forgave her for that because I think by the time he was in his late teens, she just loved her little boy and wanted him to be happy, no matter what he was. Wow. Yeah, right. What did you learn about yourself in the process of writing this book? All of the books I've done, I've written four biographies. I did Chet Baker, Peggy Lee, and Lena Horne, and then George. So I choose these very complicated, deep, conflicted people who are struggling with all kinds of issues and turn it into beautiful, meaningful art. I have chosen probably every subject I've ever chosen for an article or a book <clears throat> because I felt there was something there that could teach me about myself. I was drawn to those subjects because I felt that if I explored that story, I could answer some of the mysteries about myself. I was happy to realize that whatever self-hatred issues I grew up with, I'm just, I'm, I'm completely ignoring the your viewing audience. Forgive me, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm transfixed with you as we speak. And um, I learned to my great delight that I had escaped the worst of that self-hatred. I had some of it growing up and I had conquered it. And he couldn't. Couldn't do it. I'm grateful that I could. Uh, I set my mind to it. Like I indicated at the beginning of our discussion today, I was a very determined young man. I figured out very early on what I wanted in life and what I felt would make me happy. Uh, and it all involved writing, telling stories, language because I revere the English language. It's sad for me to see the, the, the ruin that the, I've used that word before today, but the ruin that the English language is currently in, it pains me greatly 
to see how disrespected the English language is because I've devoted my life to trying to master it. Uh, but I, I knew, I, I learned how to read when I was four. And at the age of five, I fell in, I, I heard my first, I fell in love with my first record, an old record that was around the house of Patti Page singing the Tennessee Waltz and a sad song about rejection that I related to on a deep level at the age of five. I'm so <laughs> It's like, right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so that song. And uh, that song made me um, crazy about the, the human voice. And the human voice is also, spoken delivery is also in a state of ruin, which I could talk about some other time at great length because I love beautiful voices. I love expressive voices. And so I thought, I, here's something I can write about. And uh, the, these, so these two things merged in my very young brain. And I was one of the lucky ones because I found my bliss and it really was my bliss. Mm -hmm. George found his bliss to a certain degree. He was a great singer. He was a beautifully expressive singer, fully in the comp belonging in the company of the other great singers I've written about. Um, and he loved making music, and it was what gave his life its worth. But it, it wasn't enough to make him love himself. Are you loving yourself? Yes. That's good to hear. Yes. I am. My life is wonderful. It's not been an easy road. I've been doing what I do again. I, I, my, I first ventured into it when in, in mid college, and I got to do, I got to devote my life to this thing. And I have something to show for my time on earth thus yeah. far. I have five books, I have all these articles, I have a website, folks, called jamesgavin.com. A lot of my work is on that. And it, it shows what I'm into. I, I, I like telling honest stories because my belief is that the only story worth telling is an honest story. And I, I think the, probably the reason that any of us put these creative efforts out into the world is that we want to make bridges, we want to touch somebody, we want to connect with, with people. Because when you do that, you feel less alone. And that's so much of what your work has been about. Thank you. Thank you. And, you, and yours as well. Thank you. Well, I, I feel very fortunate as well, because who I am here is who I am there, and there's really not a whole lot of difference between my public life and private life. There are some differences, but not like this huge identity split, perhaps mm -hmm. the way it's been for George and for mm -hmm. many others. But I think people like George Michael are partly to thank for the privileges I've enjoyed. I mean, uh -huh. I came out in 1989, and that was before George Michael, but nevertheless, his public outing, and even the, the way he was outed against his will, but just sort of like, yeah, he was having sex in the bathroom, and who hasn't, folks? I have. Um, but that is, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, all right, so he's not necessarily doing the I'm the most perfect gay, homosexual, pristine thing. I mean, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm gay, and not only do I have sex in bathrooms, but I'm going to make a video about it just to fuck with y'all. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. because one of the great things that came out of that terrible incident is the fact that he was then very publicly out about the lives of gay men yeah. and he was talking about stuff that people had been afraid to talk about uh pe with 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 the gays is if you're kind of a goofy safe harmless gay nobody really cares because you're not a threat to anybody but when you're a big famous star and you're hot and uh and you're talking about an aspect of gay life that puts people off uh, and yet makes gay men feel less alone. That's that's an achievement. Yeah, and that's what he did for the rest of his life. I wish that I could say that doing that really signaled some kind of emancipation on George's part, that he really felt free. I wish that he could have experienced that liberation that that gave the rest of us at that point. Yeah, he could. You know, I mean, all we had at that point that was right before Will and Grace, which is great. Will and Grace was a wonderful thing, but it was also again sort of. Could, a vision of these respectable gays in New York and 
it is what it is. I think it did a good job, but I've always been more interested in the represent representation of the queer perspective, which is challenging some of the social norms, challenging some of the ideas about sexuality and sexual expression. And I felt like George Michael really did that, even though it wasn't fully by his own choice. But he went with it when it did happen. And I just wish it would have brought him as much joy as it brought so many what, of us. What he did was perhaps more truthful than what people saw in Will and Grace. Not to denigrate Will and Grace, because it, it, it was a step in the right direction at a time when nothing there wasn't anything quite like that on television. Um, and what George was doing was the dangerous side of gay yeah. life that scared people, yeah. but that 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 made that, that gay men were just eating up with a spoon. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything I haven't asked you about George? I know we've only skimmed the surface of your life and your pursuits, but oh. in terms of this book and this project, anything we didn't talk about that you'd like for people to know or understand about this journey or about George's struggles? Um, gosh, this book was really hard to write. It uh, was like pushing a boulder up a hill for five years. It was hard to get what I needed to write this book. I got it ultimately, but in the past, getting interviews was a piece of cake. And for this one, because of George's, there were many layers of protection around George, even in death. And I had to do a lot of groveling, a lot of begging, I got a lot, I had to deal with a lot of rejection, which is, you know, getting back to Patty Page and the Tennessee Waltz and how, how rejection was a, a hot button topic for me when I was a very small child, and it still is. And so that was hard for me to deal with, but I soldiered on as one must. I had a deal to write this book, and I was determined to do right by George. I wanted the truth. The truth about George had not really been told up until that time. And, uh, and I just wanted to show people this guy's struggles and, and, and how he turned them into something beautiful and moving that people could relate to. I'm fascinated by the flaws in the, the lives of the greats. Uh, the flaws are what make everything possible. I embrace it all. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe in whitewashing any of it mm -hmm. because that's where you learn what people are really made of. When they're faced with these challenges and they go crazy or they crack and they heal and they go onward, I could babble on about that a lot, but I'm, I'm so interested in the, these complexities of, of human nature. Great. Uh, there are some people who will worship a star and are offended if you say anything bad about mm -hmm. them in print. Mm -hmm. But that's ridiculous. So who's You're next? Like, who, who would you like to cover next? Well, Damon, I am uh, working on what I, I guess it's a between books book, and I'm not sure if you know this name, but a British publisher asked me if I would write a book about one of my great fascinations in life. They do a jazz series, and it's shorter books than the tomes that I normally write. Uh, but they asked me if I would write a book for them about Anita O'Day. Anita O'Day is a jazz legend, one of the great singers in the history of jazz, and a notorious bad girl who was, in the 1950s and 60s, addicted to heroin for 16 years. And Anita O'Day wrote a memoir that almost became a film in the early 80s. She was on 60 Minutes. She recorded albums that are considered milestones in jazz. She was a kooky, outrageous personality. She was one of the ultimate um, examples of the, of, of the jazz life, the freewheeling, totally spontaneous, hang on to your hat, uh, uh, take wild chances and, you know, and hopefully survive them. And she, in fact, she lived into her late 80s, which is a miracle. But I knew Anita. Uh, I was in her company many, many times, and I revere her body of work, and it's as good a story as I've ever told. So this book won't take me the length that the other books uh, took, but that's what I'm doing right now before I figure out what I want the next big one to be. Okay. Yes, but the George Michael book still has a lot of life left. Wow. Well, I hope people watching this will think about getting the book, learning, see what we can learn from George Michael's life. It's um, called George Michael, colon, a life. 
life. And it'll be right below if you're watching this on YouTube. Look at this arrangement of, of We've got like our icons here. We've got our share, our Freddy Quackery, our little just random. This is so adorable. Or... This is so adorable. <laughs> And I'm just really interested in continuing this conversation with people about how we can think about aging and getting older as gay people in a way that might lend itself to being more empowered, more rooted in who we are, so that we can experience so much of the joy that life has to offer, whether we are on a stadium stage or never. But just to, I think the more we know ourselves, the more we love ourselves, the more we respect ourselves, the more likely we are to be able to have relationships, careers, experiences, and fun in our lives that sustain us during this experience and be less likely to experience the kind of anguish and depression that, that George experienced in his time. Yeah, I'm with you, baby. I grew up revering older people because I was so interested in the past. Yeah. I wanted to talk to the people from the past because they, I felt, were the keepers of the secrets of life. Yeah. And they had the stories that I wanted to hear. And uh, I had that going for me. I've, I am not ageist at all because, I'm, and if anything, I'm kind of the opposite. I'm kind of a snob about age and experience because and, and you know what? Time, time passed, however, and I began making a lot of uh, younger friends. I have a lot of friends in their 20s and 30s, and uh, the special ones, though. I, I'm very good at sniffing out the special ones, the oddballs, mm -hmm. uh, who don't fit into any of anyone's preconceptions about what millennials or Gen Zers are. And I'm finding that it's really important to stay in touch with what young people are thinking and feeling yeah. because that's today you cannot cut yourself off from the present no matter how you may hate it I, I'm not this is the first time in my life when I can say that I really don't like the times I'm living in but I have thrived despite that and then you always it's so refreshing when you meet these special young people who kind of have it figured out and who have a personality and a voice of their own and are interested in the things that matter to me. Yeah. Uh, and they're out there. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I went to, I can give you numerous examples of that, but, but recently I have a, a friend named Dr. Vince Pellegrino who is a professor at Hofstra University and has uh, a gay-themed interview radio show at the radio station there. And I spent some hours at the campus at Hofstra, and I met a number of these terrific young people, serious, focused, polite, and it gives me hope for the future. The other night, I did some emceeing for my friend Richard Barone, who's a musician and a producer, and just uh, released a book about Greenwich Village in the 60s. And so at the bitter end, one of the last surviving uh, bastions of old Greenwich Village, I was on stage there asking Richard questions. And in between our interview segments, um, he had his students, because he teaches a class in this subject at the new school, so he had his students coming on stage and um, singing songs by Pete Seeger and singing songs by the Velvet Underground, all this stuff that had happened long before they were born. And these kids, man, they were great. Yeah. They took it so seriously. They had reverence for the past. They had reverence for the stories. They, they were just, they, they, all of them, every one of them had some kind of special flair yeah. of, around them. Yeah. So. And so, as I said on stage, I said, your students are giving me hope. And uh, we need hope, don't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what gives me hope about the young people or how the uh, election recently turned out, even though we're not going to talk about politics, but that gives me hope because young people showed up and voted, and thank you, young people who showed up and voted, especially in Georgia. That's a whole other subject. We won't go there. Don't worry. How Now you've done a bathtub interview with me. How are you feeling right now? How's that I, feel? Could, I could do this for hours. Great! See? Aren't these fun? Oh, I knew it would be. All right! I like the opportunity to talk because it's not normally what I do. And I really thank you for having me here oh, today because it's pleasure. been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. You're very easy to talk with. 
And uh, I enjoy talking about meaningful things. Well, then let's just read. There's a lot we didn't even get to. So we have to make sure that we do another one of these. I, well, another yeah. tub, more bubbles, more celebrity interests. Yeah. You've kind of lost the bubbles. Are, the bubbles are, are getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and people but, I would, but I would love to great. count me in. People want to follow your work. You mentioned your website earlier. JamesGavin.com. And I'm on Instagram, but not nearly as much as I should be. I, I'm, 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 I love Facebook because it gives me the opportunity to write yeah. stuff. that And to start these little discussion forums, which I love to do. Yeah. And people chime in with their own thoughts. And it's all very civilized. I don't do hot button subjects. I do things that, like we've talked about today. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, anyway, so yeah, Great. that's my social media story. Twitter, forget about it. Yeah. It's just hopeless. I um, Years ago, I did my due diligence and opened a Twitter account because people told me that I should. And it was a total waste of time because nobody cared. I The most I could hope for was maybe three little hearts or next to my thing that nobody retweeted. <laughs> Just unless you're a celebrity, I think it's really hard to get any kind of traction going right, on Twitter. So, right. so uh, your website and Instagram might be the best place for people to and follow you and, and, and Facebook. And Facebook to check I'm not out quite, okay. I'm close to, but not quite up to my five thousand. Okay. So, if you like what you saw oh. today, friend me on Facebook. Friend me on under Facebook. James, under okay. James Gavin. You, I look exactly in my picture, recent picture, <laughs> like I look. And if you like this, subscribe down below. The more subscribers, well, I may do live streaming soon. That's a whole other story. But subscribe down below, and uh, you'll get access to Tub Talks right away. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks thank for watching. You. Thanks for your time, folks. Take care. <laughs>